Welcome to the Control Engineering webcast, IT Technology in OT Environments, Key Trends from the Field, sponsored by PTC. I'm your moderator, Mark Hosky, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Control Engineering and CFE Media and Technology. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you're having technical problems with the audio or the slide presentation, Click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. But if you do need a technician, type a message in the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Individual technical questions will be answered in the Answered Questions box. Type questions for our speakers in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. The live Q&A session will begin after the presentation concludes. Today's webcast is being recorded. You will receive an email within a week with the link to the on-demand event. To download a certificate of completion and a PDF copy of the presentation, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Those documents will also be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. Now I'm happy to introduce today's distinguished speakers. Chris Mistur has a unique combination of skills, a hands-on understanding of manufacturing digitalization and the ability to communicate to digital transformation to audiences who understand what this is and where they need to go, but are unsure how to get there. Chris considers himself a lifelong learner who combines technical knowledge with the ability to spot waste and apply systems thinking to a solutions approach. His work with manufacturing data and in the IT com IIoT community has led to speaking at several conventions. Chris recently formed Mr. IIoT out of the desire to help businesses grow and thrive through evolution and optimization. The fourth industrial revolution is here and Mr. IIoT's mission is to help manufacturers embrace Industry 4.0 and bring the concepts of smart manufacturing and the industrial Internet of Things to their businesses. Jeff Bates leads the product marketing area for ThingWorks portfolio of edge and connectivity applications, including ThingWorks and industrial connectivity, KEP Server EX, and all KEPware products, the ThingWork Edge microserver and the ThingWorks Edge SDKs. Jeff works closely with end users, partners, and industry experts to develop relevant, high-impact messaging on the value of ThingWorks connectivity solutions. Prior to this role, he consulted with leading manufacturers, helping them define growth strategies and tactics. He received his MBA from the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. Thanks in advance to the speakers for assembling the glossary of acronyms used in their presentations available in a couple of slides near the end of the presentation, and it's also downloadable in the downloadable version. Jeff, please go ahead. Great. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, so I want to start by setting the stage for, for what folks can expect today. Uh, and really our hope or our, our goal for this session is to illustrate how technology that was created for IT practitioners can be used to benefit operations or OT practitioners. Uh, so let me just say up front, I'll start by, uh, by saying that I fully recognize that IT technology actually translates to information technology technology. Where in a little bit of a, a ATM machine or automated teller machine machine type of situation here. Uh, but really technology that came out of an IT environment or that was born in an IT environment is, is much more cumbersome. So we'll, uh, we'll use IT technology um, throughout the presentation and, and uh, hope you can uh, forgive us for that. So again, the, the thesis of the webinar today is, is really that operations or OT engineers can benefit from technology that 
is really traditionally used in more IT focused environments. And that, uh, you know, while, while certain IT technologies have been used in OT environments for some time now, that it's, it's not, uh, not new that IT technology is used in OT environments, we're actually seeing the need for a bit of a paradigm shift for manufacturers and other production organizations to be able to fully take advantage of these technologies. And of course, um, as we know, the, the most valuable section of the, the presentation is always around uh, examples from the field. So we have uh, three examples of technologies, IT technologies, that have been successfully deployed in more operations or OT environments. So we'll go into, uh, into details on those. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, uh, just as Mark said, we do have a, a glossary of terms. We use a lot of acronyms in this uh, presentation. We believe that they're all fairly common acronyms like PLC or SCADA that, that anyone working in a production setting uh, who has an interest in technology would be familiar with. Um, but in case there are, there are also a couple of IT-focused uh, acronyms in here, so we do have that glossary of terms that, uh, that's downloadable, as, uh, as Mark said. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's dive in. So to give a little bit of a preamble to this, there's been a lot written about the convergence of IT and OT, uh, and, and I think that's for good reason. It's a subject that's worth writing about. But, and, and that's true because when you define it broadly, it's one of the most complicated challenges that, uh, that we face as an, as an industry. That said though, there are many different facets of the challenge from how the two different groups uh, interrelate on a personal level to uh, the processes um, to actually merge these, uh, these two groups to organizational structure. Should they be two organizations? Should they be one organization? And those are all definitely topics that are worth discussing. But for the purposes of the conversation today, we're going to look at a very narrow piece of that challenge and looking specifically at how technologies that were created in IT environments can be useful to engineers that are working in OT or production environments. So we're really going to take the OT point of view here, the operations point of view. Uh, the examples that we show will be of manufacturers and process organizations getting value from these IT technologies. Uh, if you're not on the operation side of the house, uh, we believe that this, this uh, material can still be valuable to you, but we want to make sure that everyone is aligned um, on, the, on the purpose and, and where we're going to take the discussion today. Yeah, Jeff, uh, this is Chris jumping in. I, as I'm sitting here, I'm kind of thinking about uh, the people listening in. You know, I, I, I'm wondering which side are the people on that are listening into our to our webinar, and will they really be able to get as much as as we promised them, and and we really hope to. Um, you know, and as you kind of have demonstrated here, the different technologies, they've the IT side and the OT side, they have matured at their own pace to their own needs and their own requirements, right? It, you can't really put a robot in an IT environment unless he's serving you drinks as I'm sitting on my couch updating servers or something, you know. Right, yeah, no, good good point that the the uh it's been much more of a uh we've seen much more of operations borrowing technology from information uh technology. Um and I think that is, as you say, a result of of kind of both of them maturing at the at the same pace and also um you know some of the key requirements of the operation space with you know one example would be determinism that isn't uh, quite as necessary on the IT side but if you're cranking out uh you know however many parts a minute um that that determinism is uh, is absolutely critical so just to provide um another uh, another caveat um we recognize that uh, technology has to drive value. And it, it's important to note that even though we're focusing on the technology piece, we're not advocating for or promoting the use of technology just for technology's sake. Uh, what we found, and, and Chris can, can speak to this at length, I think, but, but implementing technology without changes to processes or, or training people, it usually just doesn't uh, get the business benefits that we're all shooting for. So to, 
to give a concrete example of this, we see this in a, in a lot of cases in the, in the connectivity space. There are a number of organizations that uh, simply connect to their production assets for the sake of connectivity without a specific use case. But without that specific use case and without it involving the actual operator as, as shown here, the organization doesn't, uh, doesn't get the full benefit of that technology because the, the person who's doing the work and making the decisions is not uh, involved in the process, process and is not seeing the results of that connectivity. So, totally. I, I, I totally agree. Sorry for jumping in again. No, no. Um, as okay. much as these initiatives, I believe, must be driven from the top, um, also it, it's a, it's a bottom-up initiative as well because the people that are on the floor that are touching the product day in, day out, they're the closest ones to the customers, and they know the intimate details that they need to know to produce the right product at the right time. It's very important yeah. to involve the operator. Yeah, so, so uh, I, I think that the, the takeaway here is really that implementing uh, technology is, um, is, can be fairly complicated, um, is a is more than just understanding the technology, is really understanding the, the people and the processes. So just to give the example on the, um, on the uh, connectivity front here, you still need to implement the technology, connect the, the machine, but there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, you, you need to connect and have a use case in mind so that you know whether or not it makes more sense to send data directly to the cloud and, or in some instances, it may make sense, more sense to have that data be at rest uh, in an on-premises uh, database or, or solution. And then, uh, again, just to illustrate the, the com some of the complexity that comes in here, you really need to add context to that data. And, and what I mean uh, is that that data, once it gets into either of those solutions, isn't necessarily formatted in a way that makes sense to anyone. It could be, you know, Modbus register 40,001. And when I say you need to add context to that data point, I mean you need to change it from Modbus register 40,001 to this is a Boolean value that represents whether or not a particular machine in a particular plant is running or not. And it, and it could be even more, that's just an example, but it could be even more complicated uh, than that. You may need to add engineering units you may need to do some scaling. You may need to potentially even add some, some spatial data. Um, and that's, uh, that's a huge challenge today. And it doesn't, it doesn't end there. You need to work with the, the operator, as, as Chris mentioned, to understand the data that's specifically required to uh, improve decision making. And once that's identified, you need to deliver that data in a way that's most useful to the operator. Uh, and that could be a you know a summary screen that's that's um, sitting above the entire line. Could be more of a personal dashboard on a tablet, or it could even be um, augmented reality data on a headset in an environment that uh, that the operator needs to be using both hands uh, while viewing the data. So right, again, and, and you know that that context. Sorry, that context no, no, also has to kind of roll up through through the supervisor and management upper management layers too, right? Everybody's going to want to see a different, something different about their, their data. And I see a lot of platforms that are, that are coming out, you know, some of them address this, this issue, but a lot of them do not. And in the end, you have to do what drives value. And, and at, at the same time, you have to think about that this is going to be a learning experience and keep that in mind. But in the end, the, the goal is to mature within uh, this industry 4.0. Uh, space. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, yeah, just, just to close out on this slide, I think the, um, I, I think one of the, the key points for folks to take away today, this is, this is a little bit of a caveat is that everyone should recognize that when implementing these, these technologies, there's a, uh, there's a ton of work to be done on the, on the people and process side of things, not just around understanding the, the technology. Um, and, uh, and, and getting it implemented. So that's just, you know, we want to be transparent here. Um, a lot of work to be done in, in implementation, but there's also a, a, ton of, um, a ton of value to be captured. Um, 
And so, uh, Chris, I think here it makes sense to talk about a little, a, even a little more in, in terms of uh, uh, giving folks a little bit more context around around what we're what we're talking about here. That'd be great. Thank you. So this slide, I, I took it out of Clarity first. Uh, it's, a, it's a recent book by Karen Martin, and, and I love this slide because it, it really shows you what types of data exist out there and where the value can be captured. Um, you know, at any given point in time, a factory or, or a process or any kind of business, they, they need to have feedback on what is going on with the operation, right? Where is the heartbeat? And, and, and this, should be, this data should be there available in real time. Um, you know, there's a lot of complexity to uh, how to give context to the data and be able to turn that information and then derive decisions from it. But in essence, it's breaking it down to th into three separate categories of data is demand data of the work that's coming in from your customers and how that affects your schedule, for example, or the status data of what's going on underway right now and where is our capacity or where are we having issues with machines or people or anybody, and the, the outcome data, which is hour by hour, you know, is there a dashboard for what, are, what is our target? And even if that target is made up in the beginning, uh, you start to learn and understand the performance characteristics of uh, the machinery and machinery and people together and have be able to set goals, either increasing throughput or reducing quality defects. Or, or other things too that are important to your company. And the, the last piece that I believe is important is these have to be quantified. If you, can't qu if you can't measure something, you can't improve it. And that has been a big challenge for a lot of people is putting numbers, looking at their current state and what numbers do we gauge ourselves by? And what are the, what are the values behind the company and what's important? And because in the end, you want to know if your experiments ha are, are true. Are you addressing root causes of problems? And that's one way to do that is to be able to measure it over time. Right, yeah, I think you, in, uh, in your bio, um, Mark mentioned the importance of, uh, of system thinking uh, and thinking about, you know, capturing the right data to actually optimize uh, the system is critical and, and goes way beyond just, you know, understanding a technology and, and uh, being able to implement it. So it's a, there's, a, there's a ton of critical pieces to, to this puzzle. So we do also want to acknowledge that technology is constantly evolving and this, this idea that IT technology has been adopted by OT practitioners is uh, is not new. You know, uh, there's a couple of examples of this this happening um, in the in the past. And a great example of is that of that is uh, virtualization. Clearly, a technology that was developed in the IT space, but's been but has been widely adopted in in factories and other other production environments. Uh, and, and, but that said, you know, there's, there's always folks who push back against uh, this type of, um, this type of advancement. Chris was, was telling me about a, uh, a story around when PLCs were first introduced and there were, there were folks who said, you know, you know, we got to double down on the relays, these work. Um, and so we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't mess with them. And, and, uh, you know, you can, you can walking into any, any automated uh, facility today, you can, uh, what a uh, what a step backward that would have been had we uh, had we all listened to those to those folks. So uh, yeah, and that's the, that's the story that I when I had a conversation about six months ago with with my friend from Texas who's a retired oil and gas uh, electronics engineer and, and SCADA guy. That, that's what I was kind of telling him like you know there's there's so many technologies out there that, that are available in IT or commercial. But, you know, controls engineers won't touch them because, sure, there's, there's certain specifications they have to meet, either UL standards or, you know, specific enclosure ratings for, for dangerous areas. But, but then he said, you know what, Chris, this, they had the same fears and, and concerns were happening when Relay Logic was transitioning over to PLCs. 
And I, I think it's an evolution. It just takes time. And I, you know, as much as we call this industry 4.0, maybe, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe there's a better name for it nowadays. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, certainly what we're trying to do here today is, uh, is uh, just show that this new IT technology does have the potential to create value and it, and it's worth taking a look at. Um, but at the same time, we do think that, you know, there is, uh, there is a bit of a paradigm shift associated with this technology where before with some of these technologies, you could do just kind of a like for like switch where you're, switching out you know, a physical server for a virtualized environment or um, a PLC for a software-based PLC. Um, but today, we, we actually think that to fully take advantage of some of these architectures, uh, you need to uh, potentially, potentially have a shift in, in architecture. And so to, to dive into that a little bit more, uh, we'll, uh, we'll just highlight the uh, the existing or what is really a traditional architecture. Um, and here's the type of environment where you could just make a like for like switch and get a lot of benefit out of um, adopting IT technology. But we, again, we believe that in order to fully take advantage of some of these new technologies, there needs to be uh, a little bit of a change in the, in the thinking and we're not saying certainly that that you know the existing production facility has to change in terms of you know ripping and replacing existing hardware and replacing it with all new you know connected no, you hardware. Can't. No. <laughs> right, right. It's just not not an option. But we are seeing this idea of wrapping and extending uh, the the existing environment with new tools and functionality. Um, potentially adding some edge compute to push workloads to different levels of, of this environment and being able to access a lot of this data um, in, a, in an industry 4.0 or, or IIoT platform without, um, you know, without having to go through all the way up through sequentially every level. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I guess, Jeff, I want to add to that. I, I just thought about this. Um, it, it's kind of like thinking about some of the OT technologies, they're, they're, they ha definitely have a purpose for what they are they were designed to do. But right now you start talking about data and, and um, bridging the gap between business systems and, say, an HMI screen, right? It, SCADA has existed out there for a long time, but with say the advancement of HTML, right? You, you can't necessarily throw an HTML page onto a Maple Systems HMI. So what, even though those HMIs were really good for, are really good for uh, controlling the machine and, and given some status of the machine, um, the, they can be supplemented with other technologies to take that next step, but not replaced. Absolutely. Great. So, so with that introduction, let's um, let's dive into some of these examples uh, that we referenced. So, the the first technology I wanted to uh, to introduce is what we're calling data flow management. This is definitely not an official term for the for the technology. Uh, we weren't able to find a, a super official term. It doesn't seem like there's the industry has coalesced on a term for this technology, but um, that's what we're calling it. So let's uh, in order to make it a little bit more real, let's get uh, into an example here. So what we're calling data flow management really allows you, allows the user to bring the data in via one source, uh, optionally perform some processing or transformation on that data, and then send the data to another destination, potentially via a different pipe or, or a different, uh, different protocol. And one of the great things about these tools is that they really allow you to do this in kind of a drag and drop, more configurable user interface. Uh, and, and just to, to show some examples, I've, I've uh, included a, a handful of uh, hypotheticals here. Um, so in the, in the top example, you've got data coming in over MQTT, uh, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's a, it's a very popular protocol in the in the IoT, and uh, you could say this data is hypothetically coming in over a, 
a wireless sensor. Um, a handful of these, these new wireless sensors um, are using MQTT uh, to transmit the, the data. Um, so let's say you're connected to a, a wireless sensor and you're interested in the data, but say, for example, you're, you're only interested in the maximum value of that sensor reading every, every hour um, instead of the typical reading every, every five seconds, or that's the, the data that you really want to get to the, to the cloud. Uh, say you're using Azure or AWS and you want to visualize, visualize that data in the, in the cloud. So with, uh, with data flow management, you can add a node uh, with the with that logic around maximum values uh, send you know send maximum value every hour and only send that data to a cloud solution um, so only send that down sample data to uh, to that cloud solution where you're billing, being billed by the uh, the amount of data that you're sending but then potentially maybe you want to have actually a record of all the data at, at rest that you that you want to query query excuse me um, so you send all of that data at the full resolution um, to uh, a time series database. Uh, here I've got InfluxDB, which is just an, an example of a time series database, but it could be, you know, whatever historian um, you're, you're interested in using. And then just a, a couple of other, other examples. Uh, some you could take in data from an application via an API, uh, do a little bit of parsing on it, send it to a, a SQL database, or potentially even taking a file. Um, there are a handful of machines that are have kind of a file-based output. Um, you parse them within uh, within these tools and then send them to the cloud uh, via via MQTT or some other some some other protocol. Right, and, so, and here you're focusing that this data is coming from the machine, right? This you know, looking at at file, right? That that could be an Excel spreadsheet if if somebody is uh, choosing to you know, take some of their um, hourly recordings on the shop floor from a clipboard to a spreadsheet, All right? That's a, that's a solid move. Now this data could be then gone through a CSV parser and could live alongside with all the other data. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of mashing up, it gives you the ability to mash up uh, data from, from multiple sources in a, in a single solution. Um, so to, to make this even even more real, to take this out of the hypothetical, let's let's show a couple of examples of <clears throat> excuse me data management uh, excuse me data flow management tools and and the two that we that we show here are Apache NiFi and and Node Red just because they're popular examples and we've we've seen them used in uh, you know production environments more of that OT environment. Uh, so just a couple caveats here. These are both open source solutions. Uh, there are a number of fully supported enterprise options. Um, a couple examples would be BizTalk, MuleSoft. Um, but before I dive further into these, um, I'll just say that you know neither PTT, Kepware, nor Mr. IoT are endorsing either of these these products. We've just seen them uh, used in a handful of deployments wanted to give you a sense of the, the features that they offer. And certainly this is not an extensive list of, of features or exhaustive list of features for either of these solutions. You know, uh, Apache NiFi has uh, several built-in connections, just like uh, we say here on, on the uh, Node-RED uh, side of the slide. Uh, Node-RED also has security features. But these are these are simply the features we've seen um, kind of be most prominent in the in the deployments that uh, that we've we've seen. So uh, again, just wanted to give you an example of some of these tools. What we mean when we say data flow management, um, and I, I won't go through each of these uh, each of these bullets. Um, but it, in, in terms of kind of differentiating them. It does seem that Apache NiFi uh, is a little bit more complex uh, with a fair amount of uh, configuration. So it's more work to set up, but uh, allows users to very granularly see really how and when that data is being transferred and, and does have some robust tools around fault tolerance and ensuring data delivery. Uh, and then Node-RED, on the other hand, is, uh, is very user-friendly, easy to get started with, and it it does have this uh, um, this tool around the function node, which is really just a, a node that allows you to input JavaScript and, and do pretty much do pretty much anything. So, so a very flexible uh, solution uh, doesn't allow as, as granular control as uh, as NiFi. 
So hopefully this this uh, just helps crystallize um, what we're what we're talking about here. Um, and I do want to jump to the uh, the example from the field that we have. And this this example comes from from Rowan, uh, which is an oil and gas offshore drilling company. And they're, you know, we kind of joined their connectivity story um, when they're when they were faced with a changing legal requirement, which stated that safety data needed to be transmitted to and, and stored onshore. And you know, you can imagine offshore. Uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, communication options in an offshore environment. The only connectivity medium available for for achieving this goal is satellite, which is notoriously spotty low bandwidth, high latency, and uh, pretty expensive to, to transfer data. Um, so in terms of the data that they, that they needed to gather according to these regulatory requirements, uh, they were pulling data from the blowout preventer, the managed drilling systems, as well as the electrical, some of the electrical systems on the rigs. And so what they did is that they chose uh, Kepware to be able to use a, a single application on each rig to be able to combine all those or aggregate all those uh, data sources or just connect to all those uh, disparate systems. And then they used uh, Kepware's IoT gateway to convert all of that data into the MQTT protocol and send it to Apache NiFi. So this is, this is sort of where an Apache NiFi comes in. And what they did was, um, which, was, which was really pretty innovative, was to use Apache NiFi not only to downsample the data, so they, they weren't sending as much over the uh, over a transport medium with such limited bandwidth as I um, as I alluded to earlier, uh, but they really use it also to take advantage of the robust fault tolerance and guaranteed delivery tools uh, to ensure that the critical data arrived on shore even in the case of uh, a temporary communication failure. And so, just to uh, not only did this uh, architecture allow Rowan to uh, comply with these uh, mandatory legal requirements and, and continue to operate, but it, it also allowed them to implement other use cases, uh, including predictive analytics around maintenance requirements. Um, so not just uh, not just a, a regulatory compliance story, but also uh, an imp a, a performance improvement and uh, improvement in the in the maintenance um, side of things as as well. And I want to add to that, you know, looking at those uh, little satellites there, if if you think of your, your network, your industrial and your um, business network at your factory as as having as being a bottleneck and going through satellites, you envision that, then you really start thinking about that this computation and downsampling needs to move closer and closer to the machine or the process that you're that you're collecting data from. And there's ways to do that. Um, and it's always better to collect less data than more. Um, that, that, that gives you, right, it doesn't overwhelm your hardware, your network, but at the same time, it, it gives you a focus because you don't want to end up looking at having to look at a trend chart of, you know, 100 different data points and, and not really having a direction of what improvements it is you want to go after. Great. Well, with that, uh, Chris, I'll pass it over to you to to, um, uh, to walk through another example around uh, around big data. Okay, thank you. So this example is um, uh, something. In, in the end, it will make a little more sense. Uh, we started. We 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 picked the technology and we implemented it at uh, several warehouses. There were consolidation warehouses, um, and we thought, well, how can we take this to to the shop floor to where because it could be applied to, to other industries as well. Um, so I kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a pun, I call this data in motion, and you'll see it, you see a little forklift truck there. Um, and, and typically what happens in, in a manufacturing scenario and in a process scenario as well, uh, especially for batch manufacturers out there that need to produce high volume, um, and it could be high variety or, or low mix or high mix, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what typically happens is that you start networking your assets and collecting machine data. And this initiative could grow out of the OT side or the IT side. And a lot of times what you find is that you already have a Kepware server on-premise. And whether it's called Kepware 
kept server or top server. Um, it typically comes, they typically kept server also comes with other solutions that, that you might already have implemented, uh, different SCADA or different uh, analytics platforms that might exist on premise. Then once you start visualizing that data, uh, whether with a brand new Kepler installer or your existing one, and with the addition of the IoT gateway, which opens up a lot of these IT friendly protocols, uh, now you have the option of sending this data to the cloud. And there's, there's a lot of solutions out there for analytics. You know, you got your Googles and Microsofts and, and um, Amazon. Um, and they all provide a, a certain amount of value if you want to visualize data. And if you structure it in a way where, say, you're going after OEE, right, that's what a lot of people want to go after first. Uh, you find that it's, it's a very complex formula. You typically, not all your processes are fitted with the proper inputs to calculate that formula properly. So what you want to really do is start with the O, then move to the E, and then move to the next E, and see how you can tackle them and enforce some kind of standardization around this. Because realistically, even though you're, say you're playing in a brownfield, this is, this is brand new. This is brand new to you and you have the opportunity to do it how you want to do it and, and being able to scale it as well, right? Because you, you don't want to reinvent the wheel from process to process. <clears throat> so here I'm, I'm representing uh, the little funnels between Kepware and big data and uh, Kepware and business systems. It's kind of the down sampling layer or your messaging bus. And if you talk to your IT department, they probably already have a message bus in place. Uh, so it's a matter of just starting that conversation with them. Um, and here I'm trying to illustrate that as product goes from raw material to work in process and goes through its various stages of processing and eventually ends up as a finished good that's either warehoused or shipped to the customer, um, you know, operators are your experts. They're going to know the exact flow that this product takes to your factory. Uh, going on to the next slide, um, then what ends up happening is you're combining transactional data from your existing data collection system, and soon you find that those red dots and the arrows they're pointing in, those are really the, the points where um, there's an extra context or an identifier added to the data. And by creating this context, if you think about it as a track and trace function, right, you're able to follow the products through the factory, through the process, and, and for example, there, the, the blue says work order one, two, three, right? So the data, if you're lucky, you're also collecting data before the process starts and after the process starts, right? That gives you certain uh, timed events and durations that you can, you can take a look at. But outside of that, you know, it's not so, so clearly uh, defined because if you're, you know, you're expecting that a batch is going to move from a primary operation to a secondary operation and, the, and immediately be worked on, that's not the reality, right? There's scheduling involved. There's different types of constraints. Uh, so we, what ends up happening is that when you look at this data you have, the transactional and the machine data together, you, there's a big black kind of area where you don't know what's going on with your products because you're not collecting data there. You just haven't, and you don't, you don't really need to because that's not the focus, your day-to-day -day focus. Um, so, I guess going to the slide, sorry, I'm jumping around. Um, everybody that works on the factory floor, they have their supervisor to report to or their team lead, and they're working, a, they execute in a siloed environment, right? The, the downstream operation does its thing, you do your thing, and you're not really concerned about how far along they are. So what we decided to do at, at, um, at, at some factories, taking our, our idea that we've developed at, at, a, at a consolidation warehouse, is well, what if we start geofencing some of these areas where um, either context or identifiers are added to a product? And what if we're able to track uh, this product through the factory by utilizing technology we add to forklifts or other equipment that can move parts around and, you know, through the collaboration with operators and, and training and, and kind of amending the process that's currently in place, uh, 
we thought to ourselves, well, maybe we could get visibility all across the factory floor of our products in a, in a real-time uh, sense. And once we did that, um, you can see the little forklift is once the the um, the product is 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 created at the primary operation and it sits in the, the little geofence staging area. Uh, once the forklift picks up that product, and this could also this technology could supplement, um, you know, RFID or existing barcoding practices. But once that forklift picks up that batch of products, it right then you start tracking the location of that product in real time until the product is dropped off. And what, what typically happens is, right, some of the product is going to get dropped off into the uh, secondary operation stage area, but in the batching environment, there's gonna be somewhere on the side, there's always gonna be a pile of parts waiting to be processed next, right? Because we can't always be just in time all the time. It's just not reality. Um, so some of the results that we've seen with this type of application is that by taking a look at the machine data, and the transactional data that to satisfy the existing ERP and MRP systems, um, you can derive a lot of KPIs that that go that travel all the way up to the leadership of the organization to help drive the initiatives that need to happen on the shop floor to to make processes more efficient and in the end generating more revenue for the company. Right? That's how a company maintains itself, and that's how it grows. And that's how we can acquire new customers. That's how we plan to purchase new capital equipment. Um, and, and some of the results that we've seen with this implementation is also that we're also reducing the operational expenditures such as uh, RFID labels. You know, RFID labels with RFID are not cheap. They're 20 cents a piece. Uh, the maintenance of the printers, the, you know, at some point you're looking at the, you're looking at the existing way that data is being collected on the shop floor and thinking to yourself, huh, we could do this a little bit differently because now we've introduced some of these newer concepts. And the coolest thing about this is that uh, the, the value, right? The value of, of an implementation like this is less than six months. It's less expensive than other types of different implementations. And at the same time, it addresses some of the top concerns of management uh, with say when the physical, the, the physical inventory day comes around once a year, and they have no choice but to shut down certain, at least certain parts of production to be able to count the, the width that's on the floor. Uh, this is no longer a problem. They can continue running production and have that real-time visibility up to the minute of where everything and how many of those things are in a place. And if you follow, you know, then you follow these, these products with their geofencing location areas all the way to the warehouse. And once they leave, uh, then the customer pays you for your goods. All right, Jeff, please, if you have anything to add, uh, if you feel like that I missed anything, please, uh, or continue. Yeah, no, I, I, two, two things that I, I wanted to, to uh, touch on um, was one, the idea of, of silos. Um, and I think that's where we're seeing a ton of value um, in these in environments is really breaking down those silos with the, you know, if you think back to the um, kind of traditional um, ISA 95 hierarchy that we that we showed earlier, you know, each of those uh, each of those levels has a specific function, and those functions are critical. But there's also so much value or so much data in each of those levels that can be used to um, that that can be valuable to others uh, within the, within the facility. So. Um, as you said, bringing the information all the way kind of up the, the chain of command and giving visibility where it can be useful uh, is key. And then I think the other, the other thing that um, is uh, you can extrapolate as kind of a, a trend in, in a lot of these industry port auto solutions is going from, you know, batch data um, delivery to continuous data delivery, uh, so to speak. So instead of, you know, after the fact, uh, looking at, okay, here's how we did over the course of the past seven days, you're looking at, all right, here's how we're doing right now. And here's real time improvements that we can make, um, to, to improve without having to, you know, wait and sit down and do, do the analysis at the end of the week. So that's uh, a great, great example. 
So uh, our last example um, is around containers uh, and how they're how they're being used. Uh, fairly fairly hot topic in the in the IT space, and we're we're seeing um, certainly some adoption in the uh, uh, in the operation space, and we're we're seeing some uh, some value. Um, so just to start with a, a brief introduction to containers. Containers are really most easily compared to virtual machines, uh, which I think is probably a, uh, a fairly common or well understood concept in, in the uh, in this uh, within the audience. Um, just because several production facilities have set up virtual environments to host any number of, of applications, um, they, as most folks probably know, VMs allow an organization to run multiple operating systems on a single piece of hardware, as we've got. Illustrated on the on the left hand side of this uh, of this slide, so they're they're certainly great for testing or, or segmenting compute. So there's no interference between different applications, but they are uh, fairly resource intensive in terms of the amount of uh, compute and memory that they uh, that they use. Every adding a new VM to a uh, piece of hardware uh, requires another operating system, and, and operating systems, you know, just aren't designed to be that lightweight. They require, uh, you know, they take a fair take up a fair amount of resource on the uh, on the hardware. So really, containers provide uh, a less resource intensive solution. They uh, they really just leverage the host operating system so that the application hosted in the container has really everything it needs to run without requiring its own operating system and thereby uh, uses a lot fewer resources on the, on the host on the host system. And so that's, that's kind of the, the main value or, or why um, containers came into being, but there's a number of kind of ancillary benefits to this type of, uh, of an architecture. Uh, they're modular. So they can be easily updated um, instead of you know having to run an uh, an update script or whatever on uh, on an application. You can just drop in a new uh, a new container uh, with that application in it. They they provide security by isolating the the application. So the application within the container um, seems to 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 that application. It seems like it's the only application running on that. Um, on that machine where it's actually being, uh, it's sharing resources across um, uh, across multiple different uh, different containers where it could be sharing resources. Um, right, and Jeff, that's why it's yep. kind of like the Apple approach. That's why you don't see many viruses on iPhones is because, right, it's, it's really sandboxed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, um, Chris, definitely interested in your experience here, but they can run um, across multiple operating systems because they they package all the application dependencies within the within the container uh, not um, you know not to say that uh, containers well, Linux containers can run in Windows environments but in Linux environments uh, uh, one uh, container can can run across a uh, can run using a handful of, uh, of different uh, Linux kernels, so they provide. Uh, it definitely provides some uh, portability. Um, yeah, and with Microsoft, so, right, and with Microsoft's big push for, um, you know, kind of having their code run across multiple platforms, it's it's very critical at this point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so this is this is a really high level uh, intro. This is definitely kind of 101 level i don't think we have time to do full justice to kind of the the beauty of of containers or why they're why they're taking the the world by storm um but you know there's there's certainly plenty of information out there um docker has a has a ton of resources educational resources um for folks who want to dig into this concept a, a little bit more uh for those folks who we've we've piqued their interest um but to to dive into a technology that's being deployed in operational environments that uh, makes use of containers, I'll just introduce the idea of Azure IoT Edge um, and, and give it a little bit of an introduction. Um, so the, the product, the, the focus of the product is really to allow workloads that would typically run on the cloud to run on edge-based or on on-premises hardware. 
And so to just to directly quote Microsoft, this is a Microsoft product again, uh, not uh, you know not endorsing it or or commenting on it, but just saying that it's you know it's it's being adopted in um, operational environment and and customers are seeing a lot of value. Um, so better to let Microsoft do the tagging on on this one. To quote them, it they say that by moving certain workloads to the edge of the network your devices spend less time communicating with the cloud, react more quickly to local changes, and operate reliably even in extended offline periods. And that, you know, that makes sense. There are certain workloads that you want to, uh, that latency, even the latency of, uh, you know, a couple seconds of getting to the cloud or whatever it, whatever it happens to be, uh, is, is too much for a certain application. You want it to be, you know, not deterministic, but certainly, um, Less than a less than a couple seconds, um, or even uh, or even milliseconds. Um, so, the in order to efficiently send workloads to Azure IoT Edge, um, which is sitting down at the at the edge of the network, which could either be an on-premises uh, server or it could even be uh, you know an IoT gateway or or um, you know, lightweight compute sitting right on the line or out next to the machine. Uh, in order to, to, to easily send workloads from the cloud to a connected instance of uh, the Azure IoT Edge runtime, they, uh, Microsoft makes use of containers. Uh, and this really just enables users to quickly define a workload in the, in the cloud, bundle it quickly into a container and push it to the edge uh, and then in the future, if they if they need to quickly update or upgrade that um, the workload, then it can all be done from a central point of management. So uh, I want to make sure we have time for questions. So I'll just uh, give an example um, from the field. And, and here you can see that there's a couple of examples of the types of things that you would package into a, a container, including, again, this, this down sampling uh idea that we we discussed and is also capable in a in a tool and a, in a data flow management tool but just to um again make sure we've got time for for questions um they uh so so to give an example quickly give an example of a, of a manufacturer who's working with azure iot edge um, this is a textile manufacturer, um, can't uh, give the name specifically, but they're working with both Microsoft and PPC to connect multiple factories on the world. Uh, I will give one caveat that this, uh, they're still kind of in the exploratory phases or, or um, pre-implementation phases of, of this uh, type of architecture. But what they're trying to do and, and looking at Azure IoT Edge to, to do is track downtime on winding machines across multiple different factories. And they already use uh, Kepware, Kepserver X to connect to those machines. But instead of directly connecting to Azure IoT Hub in the cloud, they're working on deploying Azure IoT Edge to their sites. And there are several benefits to, to implementing the solution. One is that uh, there's a similar benefit to what we saw with, uh, with Rowan, which is once you get um, the data from Kepware into an edge-based compute where you can have a, a workload and some logic, uh, you can downsample to only be sending to, to either average or um, just uh, uh, clean the, the data so that you're only sending the absolutely necessary data up to up to the the cloud, and again, um, uh, most cloud solutions are on a on a consumption based uh, based model. And there's so that's that's one of the benefits. Um, there's also some uh, transforms that are happening to the data down at the edge. But I think the the other benefit that this company is really looking for is that all of this this entire um, system of data collection, including the edge module, modules, can be centrally managed uh, and updated consistently from one central location. So there's not, uh, you know, you're not requiring an army of, of developers to go out and, and uh, make changes directly on site or remote in, which could potentially um, be insecure. 
uh, you're able to manage all of this from one central point and really standardize connectivity um, through a through a single central point. So, uh, Chris, I don't know if, if you've seen um, similar uh, deployments or have any experience with with Azure IoT Edge or other uses of containers, but would be interested to get your your perspective. Yeah, no, I, you summed it up pretty well. I guess what I thought about when you started talking about standardization is, you know, I admire the controls engineers that that go out there and do the, the, take the the, the time because I know how difficult it is updating, say, a work cell that consists of several PLCs, several drives, um, you know, an HMI and all that kind of stuff. And they really try to standardize to assign uh, the same IP address ranges uh, across the different devices, but then put something like a MOXA in front of it that could do the network address translation. And it maintains that, and we're trying to achieve the same thing on, on the IT side is, you got to standardize. That's like 80% of the battle that I've been seeing. Absolutely. Great. Well, um, with that, we'll, we've only got a couple minutes for questions, but we'll, we'll quickly uh, pass it back to Mark to make sure we answer as many questions as, uh, as we can. Great. Thank you, Chris and Jeff. We appreciate your input. We do have time for a couple of questions. The audience may continue to type questions for the presenters in the Ask a Question box on the screen, and we'll get to as many questions as time allows. Ones that we don't get to today will be posted online at controlenge.com with the archived version of this webcast. Remember to download a certificate of completion or a copy of the presentation by using the Event Resources tab on the left side of your screen. Now on to the questions. Uh, how do you prevent a single ITOT um, network from having significant lag if there isn't sufficient bandwidth due to the sharing of IT and OT data. In the past, uh, SCADA networks would provide data to the data management system through a gateway, and this was done to prevent manufacturing data from becoming bottlenecked. Um, which is essential with the plant floor networks uh, not being able to wait for data from production. Um, either of you would like to address that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of networks are still, right, a lot of machines aren't even online yet. And once you start bringing them online, if, say, it's a, you know, it's a Rockwell PLC, yeah, it'll, it'll start spitting out a lot of data. It's, it's very busy. It's even more chatty uh, than your typical Ethernet traffic so I'm, I'm always you know if the budget is there having a separate industrial network hardware wise um, and nowadays you, you know there's also 10 gigabit plus uh, network switches and uh, logical ways to separate the industrial from business networks and assign quality of service levels um, but if it's a if it's a real-time uh, SCADA implementation you know, the alternative nowadays is also to start moving the compute closer to the edge, or and that's where you really get the benefit of being able to uh, trickle down data that you really are interested in and and prioritize it that way as well. And that's kind of how protocols like MQTT uh, address that. Even though it's still an opaque payload, uh, you you have ways to format that payload so that it's uh, you know and, and talking about technologies like LoRa. Right, that's a very low bandwidth protocol, um, and you really have to start thinking about what data is critical and what data needs to be trans, uh, kind of transmitted over the entire pipe. That's my take. Great, thanks, yeah. thanks, Chris. Did you have any uh, anything to add, uh, Jeff? Yeah, ab absolutely. I, so certainly, um, you know, it's, it's a very good point. I think that you know we're we're definitely not advocating that you you know that you prioritize data going to, you know, informative dashboards over data, you know, that's coming from an MES system and, and scheduling production or, or verifying production or from, you know, from a SCADA system um, as the, the question reference. But I think so two things. One is that some of these tools, and, and as Chris said, some of the tools uh, around edge compute allow you to get a lot of the richness of the, and the information that you need without sending you know, uh, again, as Chris said, without, you know, just turning a 
flipping the switch on a uh, on a you know Control Logic um, 5500 and and uh, getting all of the the data from that from that solution. Um, and I guess just the only other thing to mention is that there are um, uh, there is even more new technology coming that promises to um, to address some of this um, or with uh, with 5G, but um, Certainly, as, as Chris said, if the budget is there, some of the some of the benefits that you can you can um, get by uh, uh, consuming and and presenting this data in a, in a smart way um, are huge. So it is worth um, it is worth um, investing and in improving the network if that's if that's necessary. Because yeah, as as the question mentioned, you can't uh, you can't do this at the expense of existing processes. Hey, thanks uh, for our, our speakers. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the great questions. We'll get to as many offline as we can, so keep them coming until we close the interface. Um, Chris and Jeff, uh, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise. i also like to extend a special thanks to our sponsor, uh, PTC, for uh, sponsoring today's event. Oh, and here are the uh, glossary slides that we mentioned earlier. Uh, thank you for the speakers for putting together this uh, handy two-slide glossary of terms used in today's presentation. And uh, now that we're just about done, we'd like to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. On behalf of Control Engineering and CFE Media and Technology, I'd like to thank you for attending. This concludes the webcast. Thank you and goodbye.